Hi, my name is Cheryl Jessup. I'm a pulmonary function and sleep technologist here at West Park Healthcare Centre. Thank you for joining me today for my presentation on the what, why, and how of breathing tests. Many of you have performed breathing tests, called pulmonary function tests, or PFTs, as part of your healthcare. If you have, you will likely remember them, as they are not simple passive tests like an x-ray or a blood test. They require you to work hard and perform many maneuvers. You may have wondered why you had to blow so hard or for so long, or why you had to do the same test over and over again, or why the tests had to be repeated when they were just done a few months prior. Well, I hope I can answer these questions for you as I explain the science behind the tests, why and how we do them, and what their results mean. Inside our lungs, we have structures that look like an upside down tree with many small branches. The branches are the airways we call bronchioles, and at the end of the branches are the air sacs we call alveoli. This is a cross section of an airway or branch. It is hollow to allow the air to pass through. At the ends of the airways are the air sacs, which form clusters like a bunch of grapes. When we breathe in, the diaphragm, which is a muscle at the base of our lungs, contracts, moves down, our lungs stretch and enlarge, and air flows into our lungs through the airways and into the air sacs, where a process called gas exchange occurs. Our lungs then spring back because they are elastic, and this forces the air back out through the airways when we breathe out. When structures like the airways, air sacs, or diaphragm lose function or are damaged, as they are in respiratory disease, it changes how much air can get in and out, which affects the way you feel and your overall health and well-being. Pulmonary function tests are critical for doctors to understand how your lungs have been changed and to what degree. Your test results help doctors diagnose different types of respiratory disease, track changes in your lung function, assess the effect of medications, and also assess your risk for surgery. Before performing breathing tests, we first need to determine how your lungs would function if they were a set of normal, healthy lungs. Everyone's lungs are a different size, and their size is determined by three things. Height, age, and gender. So taller people have larger lungs, younger people have larger lungs, and men generally have larger lungs than women. So a tall 21-year-old male will have very big lungs, and a five-foot 80-year-old female will have significantly smaller lungs, but their lung size is normal for each of them. By knowing your age, your height, and your gender when you come for testing, we get an estimate of what your lung size and function should be, called your predicted values. The results of your breathing tests will be compared to your predicted results. If your results are within a certain range of your expected results, then they are considered normal. However, if they are outside of the normal range, then this shows that your lung function is abnormal. The more outside the normal range your results are, the more severe the lung dysfunction is. There are many different breathing tests used to measure different aspects of your lung function. During the testing, a technologist like myself will coach you to perform each test in a certain way with your best effort possible. Each maneuver is repeated multiple times to ensure that measurements are consistent. Consistent measurements mean that the results are valid. The tests are usually done in an upright sitting position, but some tests may be repeated lying down. Spirometry. Spirometry is the most common pulmonary function test performed, sometimes called the blowing test. To perform the test, you take a big breath in, fill up your lungs all the way, and then blow out until your lungs are completely empty and then fill up your lungs all the way again. This maneuver is called the slow vital capacity because she blew out the air slowly. The more common and much more memorable spirometry test is the forced vital capacity, where you have to blast out the air as hard and as fast as possible for as long as you can, like this. She will be coached to continue blowing until the technologist sees that there's no more air which usually takes about six seconds in normal healthy lungs, and then she'll take a big breath in again. Spirometry tells us two main things. Volume, how much air you get in and out of your lungs, and flow, how fast or slow the air flows through the airways. The amount of air is called the vital capacity, or VC, and since it was forced out in this maneuver, it is called the forced vital capacity, or FVC. Vital capacity is how much usable air you can ever have in your lungs. You do not use all of your vital capacity with each breath. You only use a portion of it. The rest of the capacity is reserved for things like laughing, crying, coughing, 
and exercise or whenever more air is required than just a regular quiet breath. The forced expiratory volume in one second, or FEV1, tells us how much air came out of your lungs in the first second. By looking at the amount of air that comes out in the first second compared to how much total air came out, it becomes very clear whether your lung, lung condition is obstructive or restrictive and how severe the condition is. These are two very broad categories of lung disease, each changing lung function in different ways. In obstructive disease, the airway openings are smaller because of inflammation and mucus, and the air sac walls are weakened and may be broken down. This makes the lungs less elastic or more floppy, so they don't spring back as well, so it is harder to breathe out. The airways are also less rigid, and blowing hard makes them collapse so that the opening inside them gets even smaller and the air comes out slower. It may take 15 or more seconds to blow out all the air in those with obstructive lung disease compared to six seconds in normal healthy lungs. So even though it is difficult and it feels like you have no air left when you are blowing, if your coach is telling you to keep blowing, it's because there is still air coming out, just very small amounts and they're coming out very slowly. Sometimes blowing out hard also makes the airways collapse completely which prevents some air from coming out at all. If this happens, then your vital capacity will be lower than normal because you aren't able to get all of the air out. In restrictive lung disease, the lungs are smaller and more stiff, which makes it harder to fill up with air because the lungs cannot stretch fully. In disease like pulmonary fibrosis, the air sac walls are thicker than they should be, which makes the lung more stiff and hard to expand. Other things that can make the lung difficult to expand are changes outside of the lungs, like problems with the diaphragm, changes to the chest cage, and even pregnancy and obesity because the lungs are restricted from expanding fully. Other causes of restriction include neuromuscular diseases like muscular dystrophy or multiple sclerosis, which slowly weaken muscles of the body, including the muscles we use to fully expand our chest and allow the lungs to fill up. So in restrictive lung disease, the lungs are stiff, making it harder to fill up, and the air comes out faster because the lungs spring back too quickly. So when blasting out the air for this test, it may only take one or two seconds for all the air to come out. A quick analogy is to think of a normal lung like a new deflated balloon out of the package. You blow it up, and when you let it go, the air comes out quickly on its own because the balloon is elastic and wants to spring back to its original shape. In obstructive lung disease, it's like the balloon is overstretched and loose and floppy so that it takes longer for the air to come out. Whereas in restrictive lung disease, the lungs are smaller and harder to blow up like a water balloon. There may be overlap of obstructive and restrictive conditions, which is termed mixed pattern or mixed lung disease. Barometry is also used to assess the presence of asthma called bronchodilator response test. Asthma is a form of obstructive disease because it is harder to get the air out. Airways are surrounded by smooth muscle. In asthma, these muscles tighten and constrict, which makes the airway smaller, making it hard for the air to pass through. To determine if asthma is present, a medication called a bronchodilator is administered following spirometry testing. It is usually salbutamol, known as Ventolin. If the muscles around the airways are tightened, then Ventolin will relax them so the airway goes back to normal size. Spirometry is then repeated after a short wait time, about 15 minutes. If the amount of air increases or the flow of air gets faster by a certain amount, then that shows the muscles around the airway were tightened and that asthma is present. Asthma can be present alone or along with other types of lung disease like COPD or fibrosis. So this brings me back to the importance of spirometry especially the forced vital capacity maneuver. It helps determine general lung condition, obstructive or restrictive, or a mix of the two, and how severe it is. It can be used to tell if your lung function is improving, getting worse, or staying stable over time, and shows how your lungs respond to different medications. It is understandable why it is the most widely used measurement of lung function. Now, there are other tests that are used less routinely, but give us more specific information about lung function. Diffusion of carbon monoxide in the lung, or DLCO. Our bodies get oxygen from the air we breathe. For the oxygen to get into our blood, it has to pass through our lungs. This movement of gas from our lungs into our blood is called diffusion. This test measures how our lungs are functioning to enable oxygen to get into our blood. 
When we breathe in, the air fills the air sacs, which are covered with blood vessels, and gas exchange occurs. Gas exchange means that oxygen from the air we breathed in moves from the air sacs into the bloodstream, while at the same time, carbon dioxide, which is a waste gas, moves from the bloodstream back into the air sacs of our lungs so we can breathe it out. This exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide happens through the walls of each and every air sac. Anything that affects these walls can affect the ability of oxygen to get into the blood. This test uses a special gas mixture to estimate how well oxygen diffuses through the air sac walls into your blood. For the test, you will be coached to fill up your lungs all the way with the gas mixture, hold it for 8 seconds, and then blow out completely into the machine. First she has to empty her lungs all the way so that she's going to be completely full with the gas mixture. Now she's inhaled the gas mixture and she's holding. And while she's holding, it's, the gas mixture should be passing through the air sac walls into her bloodstream, and then she will be coached to blow it back out, which she did. The machine analyzes how much of the gas mixture remains in the air that was blown out. Since we know the amount of gas in the air breathed in, and the machine measures the amount of gas that remains in the air breathed out, the amount of the gas mixture that diffused into the blood can be calculated. This means that the more of the gas mixture in the air that was blown out, the less that made it into the blood. The gas diffusion is lower in pulmonary fibrosis because the walls of the air sacs are thicker, making it harder for the oxygen to pass through them. It is also lower in COPD because the walls of the air sacs have been broken down so that there is less walls and therefore less surface area covered with blood vessels for the oxygen to pass. In asthma, the diffusion is normal because the air sacs are not affected so this test is also used to help determine if slower, air from, if slower airflow from obstruction is caused by COPD or from asthma. A lower than normal diffusion test result means that you might not be getting enough oxygen into your blood and so you may require additional oxygen as a treatment. Body plasmography, also called body box. This chamber that Lori is sitting inside is called a body plasmograph. If you have done this test before, you will remember it because the door of the test chamber must be closed and performing this test feels a little bit strange. You will be coached to breathe little breaths in and out against a blocked mouthpiece. You are not actually breathing, but just trying to breathe even though no air is moving through the mouthpiece. So you can see the, do the box door is closed and she's going to start little breaths, little panting breaths in and out. And that will be repeated four to six times with the door closed. This test measures two main things. Resistance in your airways, which is how easily the air flows. The smaller the airway opening is, the more resistance that there is, making it harder and slower for the air to move through them. The other measurement is residual volume, which is the amount of air that remains in the lungs after blowing out all the air possible. Everyone's lungs have this residual volume. We need a little bit of air left in our lungs after each breath to make sure that our lung tissue doesn't stick together. Having more than the normal amount of air left in our lungs is considered unhealthy. This air is considered trapped because it takes up space that can be used for fresh air to get in and deliver oxygen. But how can we measure air that can never be blown out? It is measured indirectly using this test. When you are sitting in the closed box and trying to breathe in and out against the blocked mouthpiece, your lungs are getting bigger and smaller with each attempt to breathe. Because you are in a closed system, the only thing that is in that system that is changing during that time is your lung size. The machine uses this information to calculate how much total air is in your lungs. Since we already know how much air you can blow out, your vital capacity, it is subtracted from the total air that is measured from this test to give the amount of air that is trapped, or your residual volume, which you can never blow out. In obstructive lung disease, there is often more air trapped in your lungs because the airways are less elastic and collapse when you breathe out so that air cannot pass through. The more trapped air in the lungs, the more uncomfortable it is to breathe. In restrictive lung disease, where the lungs are stiff and more elastic, there is no resistance in the airways and the air does not become trapped. Once we know how much air you get in and out of your lungs, which is your vital capacity, and the amount of air trapped in your lungs, which is your residual volume, we can calculate your total lung capacity, or your TLC. Your total lung capacity tells doctors if your lungs are larger or smaller than they should be. 
In obstructive lung disease, the total lung capacity is often larger because of the trapped air, and sometimes the lungs are called hyperinflated. So even though the lungs themselves are bigger, much of the space inside them is not usable because it is filled with trapped air. In restrictive lung disease, the total lung capacity is smaller because the lungs are stiff and cannot expand fully. Lastly, we have the muscle strength tests that measure how strong the muscles you use to breathe in and breathe out are. These tests are called MIPS, which stands for Maximal Inspiratory Pressures, and MEPS for Maximal Expiratory Pressures. These tests help to determine if weakened breathing muscles or a problem with the diaphragm is the cause of a low vital capacity when it is not explained by a particular condition of the lungs themselves. These tests are also useful in evaluating how the breathing muscles are weakening over time in those with progressive neuromuscular diseases. MIPS measure the strength of your diaphragm and the muscles you use to breathe in. To measure this, you empty your lungs all the way and the mouthpiece will block off so that you can't get any air. And you have to try to breathe in as hard as possible for a few seconds. And the machine will measure the strength of the pull. She's going to empty all her air. It's going to block. And now she's pulling as hard as she can for a few seconds until it opens. MIPS will be lower in those with neuromuscular disorders and those with paralyzed or damaged diaphragms. It may also be lower in obstructive diseases like COPD where the diaphragm can be affected. MEPS measure the strength of the abdominal muscles and the muscles used to breathe out. For this test, you fill up your lungs all the way, the mouthpiece will block off, and you have to blow out as hard as possible against the blocked mouthpiece for a few seconds. You may have to put your hands on your cheeks to prevent the air from going into the cheeks, and she's blowing as hard as she can. MEPS are also lower in those with neuromuscular disease. So those are the pulmonary function tests that we perform here to evaluate how your lungs are functioning while you are awake. But what about lung function during sleep? Breathing during sleep is often measured as part of a different test called a polysomnogram, or PSG, but most just call it a sleep test. The test is done in a sleep laboratory where you stay overnight with many electrodes and sensors attached to you to measure your sleep, heart rate, muscle movements, and your breathing. Your brain waves tell us if you are awake or asleep and what type of sleep you are in, light, deep, or dream sleep. Sensors on your nose and mouth measure the flow of air in and out as you breathe and also measure snoring. Your efforts to breathe are measured with belts that go around your chest and waist that move when you breathe in and out. Oxygen and carbon dioxide in your blood are measured with, a, with probes that go on your finger and arm. When we sleep, our body functions slow down. Our brain waves slow down, our heart rate slows down, and even our breathing slows down. Our breasts become a little smaller, oxygen levels get a little lower, and carbon dioxide levels get a little higher. These changes do not have a big impact on a healthy person, but for someone with lung disease, they can have a significant impact and can make your oxygen level too low or carbon dioxide level too high during sleep. Sleep is often more disturbed in those with respiratory disease because of more awakenings from coughing and shortness of breath. Carbon dioxide can also build up in your body over time because your breathing at night is not effective enough to get rid of it. By having a sleep test, we can see how well you are breathing and whether or not it is affecting your sleep. We can also see how things like your body position and dreaming are affecting your breathing. Finally, we can see whether any other sleep disorders are present, like obstructive sleep apnea, where you don't get enough air because your upper airway, which leads to your lungs, gets blocked. In this case, you may be treated with a CPAP machine. If the test shows that you're not breathing well enough when you sleep because of your lung disease, making your oxygen level too low or your carbon dioxide level too high, you may require supplemental oxygen or a ventilator to help you when you sleep. So I've taken you through the various ways in which breathing is measured, both during wakefulness and sleep. Hopefully you now have a better understanding of the importance of lung function testing, what the tests involve, and what the results mean. The more the doctors know about your lung function, the better they can determine the best treatment for you with the ultimate goal of improving your overall health and well-being. Thank you for joining me today.